welcome to the podcast. This episode's all about starting out in homebrewing. So here in Edinburgh, we are lucky enough to have a great homebrew shop. It's called The Brew Store, and it's an Aladdin's cave of brewing ingredients and supplies and anything you might need. The guys uh, really know their stuff, and they're happy to chat to you. And they also have a little brewing school, like uh, brewing classes, where they teach you how to all-grain brew or kit brew. And they have a homebrew club once a month. I managed to convince the general manager, Theo Barnes, to talk me through what it is they do and how they can help. So if you're thinking about starting to make your own beer, this podcast is for you. Thanks to Theo for chatting to me. Well, the, the main question is, why should we homebrew? It's cheaper for a start. Yeah. And the quality goes up so much more. But we can just chuck in as many hops as we want That's and make true. anything that we want. Um, Experiment. You get full control over the quality. Um, it's entirely your own. You can make whatever you want. There's endless numbers of reasons. It's an endless hobby. Um, it's one of those things that you can keep as simple as you want or you can make it as extensive and obsessive as you want, if you know what I mean. Uh, so you can get really involved with it, take it to massive differences, or you can just keep it as simple as you fancy and uh, get the results out of it and the results are always beer or, or wine or cider cheap beer maybe get your mates round and hey, yeah the cheapest we've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> the cheapest we've ever heard is free um, right I wouldn't expect that maybe 29 pence a pint but some of the low quality beer kits um, it's worth staring away from them you can certainly get an 11 pound 49 tin with the beer in it um, but they're, they're really not worth it I think. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of personal opinion. Let's but, see how far uh, you want to You really want to get a £24.99 for, for a good beer kit. We'll get you some ex- fantastic, exquisite beer, uh, multi or hoppy or whatever you fancy in it. Uh, that tends to be for 40 pints as well. So you're talking about 60 pence a pint at the top end. Still remarkably cheap. That's a very good reason. You don't pay tax on it. <laughs> you just make it at home, drink it when it's ready. Cutting out the middleman. Yeah, I think it's... It's a, it's a no-brainer, really, isn't it? Too right. Now, let's talk about how you get into it. So, imagine if I was a customer and I came to your shop and I've heard, you know, cheap beer, easy to make, I can do whatever I like with the, with the recipe. Mm-hmm. Where would you start with me? There is a full package called the Young's Complete Starter Kit, basically. That's fifty nine ninety five, and that's the cheapest, best value way to get started at the moment, mm-hmm. um, on the market anyway. And that gives you a fermenting bin, a pressure barrel for kegging and dispensing your beer, and all the other little knickknacks that you need to get it to work properly. Um, so they've got the hydrometer, which tells you the ABV and tells you all the diagnosis things you'll need to know about the beer. Very simple to use. Uh, sterilizing powder, probably the most important bit of it all really and brewers are just janitors with drinking habits so you've got to keep everything clean and sterile um, stickle thermometer just lets you know what temperature it's fermenting at and uh, there's a couple of other bits and bobs in there as well uh, that just help you get along with it all but for the, for the amount of gear that's in that box you get great value out of it usually when people get started we, we say uh, what, what volume do you want to brew um, for some reason someone back in the day decided that five gallons was what all the beer kits were aimed at uh, so most of the beer kits you'll find will make 23 litres five UK gallons um, th- that gives you the most choice if you're looking to experiment and play around brewing at five gallons will give you the biggest range of beer kits to choose from um, but some people think that five gallons is quite a lot to drink some especially people. if it didn't turn out <laughs> <laughs> yeah especially if it didn't turn out the way they wanted yeah. um so it's always worth bearing in mind if you want to brew smaller amounts but that does kind of limit your range of beers well a friend of mine started off doing just one gallon kits and i hadn't really considered that you could start off you know not doing the five gallon that's always recommended and so small yes it's really small but and it seems a lot of effort for a small amount of beer so um, i mean to experiment with i can understand but really if you're going to that effort five gallons makes a lot of sense i suppose yes when when it's from the kits they are incredibly simple that's one of the benefits of kits is they're so quick and easy to put together uh, all the hard work's been done all you need to do is clean and sterilize your fermenting vessel put the syrup into 
the, the vessel and that, that's what it is they've taken the uh, the sugary wort the, uh, the the malt extract which has been hopped and reduced it to a thick syrup so you just have to rehydrate it in a sense add the yeast to it and watch it ferment not all the time just leave yeah. it to itself don't <laughs> go lifting the lid on and off just leave uh-huh. it and it will take care of itself as long as it's around the right temperature um, and then just bottle it or, or keg it and it's that simple um, like I say that's the benefit of, of a kit is it's all put together and ready to go um, and the smaller size I think often inclines people to get brewing all grain brewing faster because there's that restriction in terms of uh, there's there's less uh, on the range to go around so people tend to be tempted to go and, and brew all grain faster I see you have quite a lot of different kits in the shop here I mean different beer styles as stouts and saisons and you know more experimental stuff that that would keep somebody quite happy for a while wouldn't it until they get the hang of it pretty much endless I imagine yes Uh, I I, I, I can't remember the last time I counted Mm -hmm. what kind of uh, range we've got in Um, hundreds oh my god (laughs) so if you were happy brewing with kits you would have a lot to experiment with yeah if you like the results Uh if you're satisfied with everything that's coming out um which is very the reason because they're all delicious mm. well, not all of them but most of them are delicious <laughs> it's a matter of taste yes, uh, it yeah, it's, a, <laughs> uh, it's like going to an off license so, uh-huh. in fact that's a good way to talk about the case is that we do have a range as good as an off license uh, going in and seeing the range of bottles but you'll just not find any of those beers in an off license yeah, yeah. it's a completely different uh, range and you just pick off what you sh- want, want from the shelf except you're getting 40 pints with each box you left off instead of, uh, instead of the one bottle yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes for about the same price yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how long would it take you if you had a kit and you've bought the starter pack and you've put the wort uh, the syrup in to your um, fermentation bucket and you've diluted it and it's at the right temperature you put the yeast in it and you're putting it away to ferment mm-hmm. so I'm mean, saying so you could do that in about a half an hour so and I put then, one on this morning and it took uh, took 15 minutes right um, and that involved sterilising the vessel um, pouring the kit in pouring mm-hmm. in some hot water topping it up with water and putting the yeast in um, that took 15 minutes right it's now going to take <laughs> 7 to 10 days to ferment uh-huh. I don't have to do anything in that time when yeah. I'm doing that I just do what I normally do whatever that is <laughs> um, <Work here>. yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> put on more kits yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, after that's finished you basically sterilise your bottles or your keg if it's a keg it takes very little time to do it takes about 10 minutes to sterilise your, your a single vessel if it's your bottles then Bottling is a little bit more of a faff, but it's something you'll get used to. That takes about 40 minutes, if it's bottles, to sterilise them all, because you have to work your way through each of them individually. Mm-hmm. Um, rinse them out and put the beer into the bottles or the keg. That, In total, that all takes about 45 minutes to an hour, I'd say, tops. Um, that's, the, that's the entire amount of time that you need to interact with it, is an hour. An hour. From start uh, to finish. Really? Um, in terms of the time you've waited, it takes a week to ferment, that's seven to ten days usually. Um, and four weeks in a bottle, we tend to recommend. Uh, depends on what style of four. beer it is, four weeks mm-hmm. we tend to recommend. Um, it entirely depends on what kind of beer it is. If it's very fresh, hoppy, you tend to want to drink it a little bit. On the on the quicker side, so three weeks, you could probably start cracking into it and, and enjoying the kind of fresh hoppy flavour. If it's darker or maltier or more balanced, in a sense, yeah, four weeks, maybe even longer to, to get cracking into the beer and enjoying it. And the bottles, of course, have the advantage that you can put them in the fridge. Absolutely, you can get it cold and fizzy. Yeah. Um, they are bottle conditions, though, aren't they? We should mention yes, that. So yes. So, you so you basically a care. wait for the beer to finish fermenting. Uh, the yeast, even if the beer looks completely clear, the yeast is still kicking around in their microscopic level. So, mm. if you add a half teaspoonful of sugar to each of those bottles, that sugar will re-ferment inside the bottle. You've put a cap on the top of the bottle. The CO2 that's created by the fermentation can't go anywhere, so it goes into solution, and that's what gives you beer the fizz and the carbonation. It's what brings the beer to life uh, in terms of flavour. Um, and you can get it cold if you're into your lager, then get it into the fridge, get it as cold as possible, and you'll be able to enjoy a really fizzy cold lager. It's uh, exactly wrong. If you like your stout, then maybe the keg is the best way to go, or um, a barrel, homebrew barrel. 
because the carbonation tends to be a lot smoother it's served at room temperature gives you that thick creamy head and, and not so much uh, fizzy carbonation but condition and, and life uh, brings a bit to life yeah um, tons of different ways of going about it but uh, at its simplest you just want to get the beer packaged at the end and you do want to get it packaged fairly soon after fermentation because you're always fighting against infection essentially uh, the beer going off uh, and when I say infection I don't mean like, I mean wild yeasts or, or bacteria and mould that kind of stuff you want to get it from somewhere where there's lots of air full of lots of microbes into a nice contained the environment so a bottle with about an inch of space at the top is ideal perfect uh-huh. yeah. so if you've been brewing kits for like 40 of them or so and you know you're getting really good at it and you're starting to look at recipes that would maybe not involve a kit so you would maybe think i could create my own recipe but the kits that you have here don't reflect exactly my taste Mm -hmm. I want to take it a step further we're talking all grain brewing so what's the difference all grain brewing is where the extra steps you're in charge of everything from the start to the finish of all the brewing process so when you get a kit it is a thick syrup of a wort basically the finished brewed beer before the yeast has been added to it if you're brewing for more grain, then you're in charge of every single step of creating the sugar, creating the malt flavour and the malt character, adding to that the, the hop bitterness and the hop aroma and flavour, and then selecting your yeast to kind of fit that recipe. Um, it's, it's fantastic fun because you get full control over every step of the process. It takes a fair bit longer. It takes about... The the quickest we've done it, I think, is about three and a half hours. Right. That's Uh, quite a difference to the kit. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. it's quite a a difference. Um, So, um, in its quickest way of talking about it, you have to do a stage called mashing, which is basically where you steep the grains in... steep, uh, Steep the grains in warm water 66 degrees 66 67 degrees celsius uh, for an hour um you rinse off all the sugars after that stage collect them all and boil them with hops boiling takes about an hour and then rapidly chill it after that and then that's the stage at which you were when you were brewing with the kits you've created your hopped wort and that's then ready to add the yeast to and ferment so the process after that is exactly the same? Exactly the same, yeah. From the moment you've cooled it down to, to room temperature. So if you have all the equipment for the fermentation that you bought with your starter kit, what else would you need to buy if you wanted to do all grain brewing? You want to accommodate those different stages of the process. So as I was saying about s- steeping the grain in hot water, most people want a mash tun for that, which is... At its simplest, we use a cool box with a tap on the bottom and a strainer to separate the grain from the from the liquid. So that's something that's going to hold that temperature, and it's a dedicated piece of equipment for that purpose. Um, after that, you want a boiler, something that you are going to be able to get a rolling, vigorous boil on. Um, it can't just be near to boiling; it has to be good and vigorous rolling boil. Um, for that, I because my element on my hob is absolutely rubbish, I have to use an electric boiler and it means I can take it anywhere and plug it in. Um, so a separate piece of kit for that? A one. separate piece of kit, yes. Um, or a copper co- And a copper cooling coil or just a cooling uh, heat exchanger mm-hmm. uh, after that. that. That's the three pieces of equipment that you need, really. You can get away with a boiler and a bag, so you can put your grain inside the bag Um, steep the bag inside the boiler use that as your mash tun but you just have to keep an eye on the temperature Um, and results vary a little bit because you're mixing the grain around you're disturbing the grain a bit more Um, you basically then remove the bag with the grain in it rinse off all the sugars that you can um, and then bring that boiler to the boil again if you've not got an electric boiler if you've got a really good stove you can just use a pot um, stock pot and with that in mind you can probably avoid using the chiller because you can put that pot into an ice bath afterwards uh, but you do need to rapidly chill it after use so whatever you use you're still looking after being able to hold something at a temperature for an hour get those sugars out of that uh, grain uh, sponge <laughs> type thing and then boil that wort 
and that bit of jealous afterwards. Whatever kind of equipment you work around to, to, to doing that will be great. The, the better the equipment, the more control you have of the process. So uh, we're all now singing and dancing about the grain father, which is the all-in-one brewing system, because that gives straight up some of the best results in home brewing. It's fantastic. I do have one of these grain fathers. I you avoided <laughs> I avoided having the traditional setup with the bucket and the separate boiler and um, and the cooling element because this does it all in one. Um, it looks amazing. <laughs> it looks really professional. It looks like you know what you're doing and it does everything really easily. That's the one that we got the fastest brew day on. We saw three and a half hours three on, half on the grain father, yes. Um, and it's less mess. Mm. And mm. one of the things we always talk about is extract. It's the ability to get most sugars out of the grain that you've purchased, the grain that you've spent your money on, how can you get the most sugar out of that? Of uh, and that leads to more beer or stronger beer yeah. if you're not going to water it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's basically really where equipment comes into, into play, is talking about how to improve that uh, efficiency of extracts, because uh, that ultimately just pays for itself over time. It also takes away the fact of quality. So when I first put together my, cobbled together my equipment as a student, I found whatever I could, pans, pots. Good for you. Uh, yes, but the quality of the beer was really, really low. And I didn't know if it was my recipe building or if it was the equipment itself. Of course. And so I, I can prove the kit. I eventually threw it all away and overhauled it and got a new kit in. Uh -huh. And now I'm not the green father for myself. Yeah, father. <laughs> when I get the cash, when I get the cash. <laughs> well, they, that's the problem. They're not cheap. They're around 600, 650. 650 in moment, yeah. uh -huh. But if anybody was interested in them, that is good. YouTube videos on online, yeah. and it converts into a still as well. Oh yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> if, you, if you're that way inclined. If you're that way but I just heard you talk about a new piece of kit that's maybe a little bit cheaper that does the same thing. Yeah, we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, Bulldog Brews all-in-one brewing system um, should be about three hundred and ninety-five pound. It's just in development. We're hoping that in a couple of months from recording now, it'll hopefully get launched. Okay, and it's going to be the space in between the, the grain father and kind of that putting your kit together itself um, £400 basically that kind of mid range price the grain father is always going to be the top end uh -huh. uh, in terms of the quality of equipment that's in there but uh, as an order one brewing system goes this, this bulldog booze kit we're, we're looking at it it could be great could be good could be good yeah. could be good yeah <laughs> <laughs> exciting just seen it today so <laughs> yeah, right. new off the press so once you've got the hang of making the beer and you come here to your shop and you frequent your um, hop selection and your malt selections and your yeast selections what help can you offer people like that with recipes? We're pretty good at building recipes uh -huh. because we have the pleasure of sitting down and doing it all day long. Uh -huh. it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're initially getting started, we tend to recommend a fixed recipe to get going with. So we've got our range, which is small batch brewery. We've been working on recipes a lot. So we have a stock of uh, recipes that we know are good and reliable because uh -huh. we drink them in the shop. Uh -huh. We're not allowed to sell it, but we drink them. Um, so we have our own range of recipes, which we know how they're supposed to taste. So you can bring them in, we can talk about it. Um, and they've got full instructions. So you can walk your way through the brew day. You know what you're supposed to be getting out of it. It's got the full instructions beside it and that will get you started. And if you like them, you can obviously carry on brewing them. Uh, if you want to get into building your own recipes and um, really talking about it and um, obviously you yourself met through the, the homebrew club that's mm -hmm. one of the best ways uh, of seeing how to develop your recipes is, is seeing how other people like your beers mm -hmm. um, in terms of building a recipe pick a beer that you like I think is, is, is another way of going about it uh, pick a beer that you know that is commercially available um, maybe something light and pale uh, the way we all test ourselves occasionally is by trying to clone Yarl by fine beers because uh -huh, uh -huh. it's a very clean low ABV single hot beer and it's in the pub across the road yeah. so basically we can brew it taste it and just go right run how does that compare run across have a pint uh -huh. and then run back to the shop and have another pint uh -huh. it, it's how we test just uh -huh. to see how, how, we, how we're getting along um, and it's, it's great if you've got a beer in mind that you really really like you can make that but you can make it better you can brew it 
to the standard they they brewed it, and then if you want to just tweak it, that's entirely up to yourself. And it's very good to get a feel for the raw ingredients if you're cloning. So you you hold the pint, you you look at it, you see the colour of it, you get a feel for what ingredients have gone into it just by the colour and the the, the malt aroma. Then you have see it, see how strong it is. You know what kind of weight of grain has gone into there. Um, get a sense of the hops usually the breweries are now publishing the recipes online because there's no cost to them there's no damage to them to to, to show the recipes no one's going to try what well, nicking the recipes so oh. blatantly <laughs> uh, maybe they are i don't know maybe. <laughs> maybe they will. Um, but uh, there's no cost to to them to mm-hmm. pushing the recipes out there so you'll generally find people's recipes everywhere and there's clones by home brewers left right and center some of them are completely bogus. Some of them are spot on. All right. Yeah, you just need to keep an eye out. Uh-huh. Uh, and from that, it's uh, that's one of the most pleasurable things about it. It's a learning curve, just uh, getting a sense for the ingredients. It feels like something quite natural. It's not that you can sit down and write out the sums, but it's when you start drinking it and tasting it, that's where it becomes a, a real hobby. Of course. Um, and a real pleasure as well, yeah. And you can enter these beers into competitions where maybe... A certain style is required, you know, if you're building a particular beer, you can enter it into that category and... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, most of the Expand your knowledge. categories... <laughs> most of the times that people don't win prizes is when someone tastes an absolutely fantastic beer, but it's been entered in the wrong category. Right. Happens an awful, oh, awful no. amount. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so a fantastic beer that's just been entered in the wrong category. Yeah. Yeah, people could be quite strict about categories. I tend to not be, but... <laughs> yeah. 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 You mentioned briefly your um, meeting, the homebrew meeting, and I know that uh, out of the brew store here you've got um, some individuals that have started a homebrew meeting together where people meet once a month to discuss their beers. Is that something that you encourage people to come along? Oh, I Oh, I know. So that's, uh, yeah, we, we started that um, from the shop about three years ago, and it's been drawing people from all over. Scotland, really, uh, as far afield as Dundee and Aberdeen, coming down to Edinburgh to just to bring along the beers and just to see what other people are brewing. It gives you a great sense of kind of what the grassroots of brewing is all about because this is usually where brewers start. Um, most of the breweries are in Scotland, they all start from home brewers. It's a great way to see what ideas are being floated around, and it's also great because other people have got different tastes and can see other off flavours they notice if something's gone wrong or if something's gone especially right mm-hmm. and they'll give you the feedback accordingly mm-hmm. uh, most of them have had the same problems or, or, or successes and be able to tell you where you're going right or wrong and it's uh, and then it's up to you to whether to listen to them or ignore them because yes. it, it's uh, amongst mm-hmm. peers you, uh-huh. can, you can do what you fancy uh-huh. uh, which is a really good way to go about it uh, we're, we, we, we publish published big word so um, we put up the feedback from the club on our blog just right. to kind of try and bring people in because it's a club because it's a meeting there's obviously no way for people to come from further afield just for a club just to taste each other's beer um, but uh, we're always hoping that people will send us beer in the post <laughs> just in case <laughs> uh, so we, we like putting up the beers on, on the blog site just to just to show the diversity of things that people are bringing do you evaluate them a little bit before you put them up? Do you help people like that? Um, well, it's there's a general chatter around the evening, people uh-huh. generally giving feedback left, right and centre. Um, myself, I try to stay semi-sober <laughs> and take notes and try and get everyone's opinions. Uh-huh. But obviously, I then kind of try and filter out the abuse. <laughs> try and uh, filter out the constructive criticism uh, and the, uh, the, the actual quality of beer at the beer club is phenomenally good phenomenally good um it's it puts in perspective when you go along to beer tastings and and things that are held in off license where you say try this beer try this beer and you come to a homebrew club and you try 45 different beers small amounts but you try them all and no two are the same the quality is even very very high and uh, you'll never really taste any beer like that again it gives you the biggest breadth of experience in terms of beer and beer tasting and and understanding what you're after yourself yeah it's fantastic I mean just even speaking to all these people who have all the different experiences what I get out of that homebrew club is is invaluable really I mean how many beers would you need to pick off the supermarket shelf and look into how they were made and you know get all the information on them and try them 
whereas you can just have a, a couple of little sips and work your way around the table and see what everybody's brought. It's fantastic. Absolutely right, yeah. This is probably, from what I can tell, the funnest part of brewing is really is the developing the recipes and finding your niche and you know trying out new it products and beers. Depends on who people. you are. That's one of the things about brewing is it, it spans so many different things. Myself, of course. I oh, university I studied classics and I was certainly not into the science or, or anything like that but it incorporates people from all backgrounds arts science um, people will always have something to find in it um, you could come from that from any perspective what I'm saying is if you're massively into the sums and that kind of stuff you could just look at brewing from a calculations because it's got a lot yeah. of equations you can sit down and just enjoy the sums yeah the scientific you, aspect of it yeah, if you're that <laughs> but, uh, and, or you could just enjoy getting a buzz if you want to just talk about enzymes forever that's yeah. fine uh, well, sorry <laughs> um, whereas yeah people just who have a, a little bit of enjoyment for putting together flavours or just experimenting. A lot of people I know don't brew for flavour anymore. They just brew just to see what the ingredients will do. It's not even trying to create anything at the end. It's just trying to see what happens. Uh-huh. Just interested in the flavours, uh-huh. just to understand yeah. them. Okay. It's a general fascination with how for raw ingredients of your malt, yeast, hops, and water come together just to make something completely remarkably different each time. Yes. Um, yeah. And then you can start chucking in whatever you want else, and on top of that, strawberries or leather I don't know oh, <laughs> licorice <laughs> yeah <laughs> so just to finish off what would you say your most frequently asked questions are you've set lots of people up with their homebrew equipment they're away they're trying it out what are the most common questions of people that throughout the stages why is my airlock not bubbling mm. is the first one we get every day <laughs> <laughs> Um it's general kind of not understanding if the fermentation's happening or not. So an airlock is a little widget that's attached to the top of your, your lid to allow the CO2 out during the fermentation and to not let the bugs back in. It makes a pleasant bubbling noise. makes sound. a pleasant bubbling noise and you can generally see the fermentation. It's very reassuring when you mm-hmm. see it going. But if you've got a, a cheap plastic bin, which is basically how most hungry vessels are, that it's just the cheap food safe bin, uh, sometimes the gas might be coming out of a little crack or out of somewhere else and that leads to the the answer for everything which is always use your hydrometer um, for, for reliable results and understanding what's going on in your beer um, this floating widget <laughs> as it were uh, tells you everything that's going on in your beer uh, basically it measures the content of sugar in the liquid so if there's more sugar you're going to get more alcohol because this is exactly where it's coming from. If there's more sugar, it'll float higher or lower. And from that, you can tell a fermentation's happening. So it's got a starting level and it's got a, a rough finishing level. And if it's not moving and it's somewhere in the middle, it's not working out. Uh, you need to add another yeast sachet. Uh, if it never got going in the first place, add another yeast sachet rather quickly. <laughs> um, and if it's right where you think it should be, then it's time to move on, take it to bottling and that kind of stuff. But that is the only way to see that fermentation is actually happening. Um, and I think that's what most people tend to worry about is, is, is my fermentation happening? Um, and that's usually because the airlock isn't bubbling. <laughs> uh, but the airlock could not bubble for any number of reasons. It's not a reliable method of understanding fermentation. It's just a, a little helpful tool to let the CO2 out, as well as helping you see that it's fermenting. Um, if that's... you had lots of cash, you could invest in a beer bog, which is a little device that measures what's happening in your beer and sends information to your telephone. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look into it. Massively over-engineered a problem. But... No, it's, it's exactly <laughs> like we're saying. Homebrew is the government from all different perspectives. Uh-huh. Uh, over-engineering is one of the joys of it all. I suppose so. I remember a lot of all, um, electrical engineers. A lot of electrical engineers go into homebrewing. Uh-huh. Uh, Dave Lyme, like especially one of them, he was an electrical engineer. He, uh-huh. he was the kind of the guy from the 1970s who got a lot of people into all, uh, into all grain brewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, electrical engineer. Yeah, so it's basically a lot of people wanting to build their own equipment, going mm-hmm. back to what we were talking about there. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. People want to see not just the process happening, but want to understand every aspect of yes. it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and maybe want to be able to control every aspect of it as well. 
other FAQs. Other FAQs. Other FAQs. Um, we very rarely get why does my beer smell funny. Very rarely does uh, beer go off now. Right. Um, because people have it chummed into them so much that sterilising your equipment is the key. Um, that there tends to be a hangover in the sense of <laughs> from the 1970s the 1970s was such a bad time for, for home brewing it was, it was great everyone was making a lot of home brewing but it was all rubbish yeah. um, and that's another question we get when we get people at the door it's like does this has it changed at all has it come along at all from the 70s and yes it, it really 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 has but in uh, the 70s it had a reputation for making you ill as well tasting terrible and making making you which depends on what you drank of it as well, well yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I still battle with that sometimes and people go oh homebrew oh right okay I don't know if I dare to take a sip you know it's got this reputation for being terrible stuff that could potentially make you blind or something like that so. yeah I've had that I've had that more recently will I go blind if I drink this is oh, no. absolutely no 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 no, no. <laughs> you think of the distillation yeah, and, right. and some quirks going on there and even yeah. then you have to be violently <laughs> out of plate <laughs> yeah. to get it wrong there mm-hmm. um, yeah general questions about uh, how will this taste and mm-hmm. the answer is pretty fantastic. Mm-hmm. It, it does come down to what you spend on the kit. Um, its quality depends on... They're not expensive for no reason. If they've added more malt to them, if they've put more hops in them, you're going to get a better quality beer kit. We always try to get people started with the better stuff uh, because people starting with a bad quality beer kit they're not going to come back yes of course um, the, the cost is all reflective on the beer kit as well and it's not much to pay, it's pay £10 extra on, on a beer kit and get a massive jump in quality when you're talking about 25 pence per pint in mm. terms of what it actually costs yeah. I think that's my sums going on there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, general kind of like I say the hangover from the 1970s of, mm-hmm. of beer was very bad when it was homebrewed back then and now it is not it yeah. is millions times better uh-huh. it is so good the the old homebrew kits still some of them still float around uh, because some people absolutely insist that that is all there is to drink oh really uh, yeah. usually an older crowd <laughs> which they, ones uh, Geordie uh-huh. uh, Geordie range um, they're £11.49 a tin as is the Young's Harvest range um, and they are you, you take the tin you add a kilo of sugar to them that in itself is already taken away from the flavour yeah. because a kilo of sugar it's not your, your malt it's not the beer ingredients it's good in strong beers really strong beers because it adds a little lightness but when it's a low ABV 4.5% beer and you've added a, and half of the recipe is just cane sugar it's going to taste quite thin quite cidery uh, is, is one of the flavours so you can generally taste the alcohol being a little bit different uh-huh. um, that, that, that does make the the quality suffer certainly mm-hmm. um, that's what I talk about in terms of the range of the kits if it's generally on the lower end you do need to add that kilo of extra sugar they are between £11.49 to £16 because they are handheld because that is what the malt cost uh, you need to add the extra sugar to take them up to a respectable ABV and uh, alcohol content so that could just be cane sugar or you could add more malt sugar um, so malt sugar is just the unhopped recipe it comes in one kilo bags most of the time and you can just put that in and it'll keep the body and keep the full flavour of the beer that said the recipe hasn't been created to be perfect you, you've still played around with it a little bit if you've got an all everything you want in one kit the quality is going to be much better because they've designed it to be untampered with okay um, I'd say the, the, the lower the, the lower cost kits are great for fiddling around with if you want to add hops yourself if you want to change the yeast or, or, or have a little play around with something it's quite fun to see the results uh, changing it's because you're experimenting with a low cost kit there's no real loss to it whereas the really high quality kits I tend to not want to play around with because they've been designed so well do you think there's a discernible difference in taste between a kit beer and an all grain beer yeah there, I think there is um, I, I think I'm pretty sure it's part of the extra process of reducing it right in a heat vacuum there's now a lot of kits that are overcoming it um, specifically I say festival range and young's American beer kits range and they're overcoming the off flavour I'll call 
twang, e- e- extract twang. Right. Well, I say our call, everyone calls it that. <laughs> um, it, it tastes a little bit tart, a little bit tarter than kind of something that's not been all grain brewed. Uh, slightly more acidic, maybe. Right. Um, and then it's very worse in the low quality kits, maybe cardboardy. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas many of these kind of new kits are kind of overcoming that by using really good quality malt. Probably, I think maybe something changing in the process and also adding hops. Hops in it. First of all, Razorback was uh-huh. the one, I think, which led the way in it. Banging in some really full flavour, zingy, citrusy American hops and the flavours are just dominating and completely coming out on top and really, really good quality beer as a result of it. And there's a lot of the followed suit as a result of it. So there's a festival, New Zealand Pilsner, again, really hoppy. Uh, Young's American Beer Kits, they've got an IPA, an American Pale Ale, an Amber Ale, really popular, but really good balance. Heavy malt character and hot balance. And really the the, the off, that, not quite an off flavour, but it, it's a, it's a flavour, is... Hopefully, if you're getting the better quality kits, it's getting consigned to the past. Right, right. But yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, you can, if you want to play around, get unhopped malt extracts, mm-hmm. which is basically where you have the tins at the ready and you boil it with the hops yourself, mm-hmm. cool it down, and add the yeast. And that basically avoids the stage of using the grain yourself. So if you want to have a little bit more authority over the mm-hmm. over the beer itself, um, effects over the beer mm-hmm. itself, uh, you can play around with the recipe. Um, you get the the malt base sorted for you. You don't have to go through that stage of brewing, mm-hmm. and you basically get to choose the hops mm-hmm. and the yeast. And that's quite fun. And fiddle around with the recipe. Yeah. It gives you an understanding for the different hop flavors uh-huh. that are going on uh-huh. in the world, and that's uh, there's a huge amount of flavour of so again that's one of the things that's almost endless how many hops have you got here a hop we try to keep 60 wow. in the range uh-huh. um, because well there's a global hop shortage coming up uh-huh. at the moment and it's uh, it's quite difficult to keep that range in for a brewery they can usually keep in I stock and change the recipes and and the beers around that, but uh, for us, because people come in and ask for something according to a recipe they found on the internet, we try to keep in the broadest range. Of course, um, which which can be hard, um, and there's some that shift a lot faster, a lot faster than others, which is totally understandable because they're my favourite hops. <laughs> which one? Uh, Citra, Nelson uh-huh. Sovin, Nelson Sovin. If we can get our hands on it, it's fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh, Simcoe, Mosaic. Um, Names it <laughs> four years ago, though it was Green Bullet, which was massively, massively popular, and then no one could get their hands on. And now you can't shift Green Bullet anymore. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it dropped off in popularity, so it's uh-huh. so you've got to be cautious about things and they've got to be kept fresh, right? right. Um, in the really the best conditions. Mm-hmm. So we've got to keep low levels of of lots of different hops in, and mm-hmm. um, try and keep the freshness up, uh, of course. Yeah, it's an endless thing, really, just kind of having that range of, of hops, and you, it, it's a pleasure to kind of be around them, to kind of to walk, uh, to just stand around them in the shop all day and just think about what flavours will work uh, well together. It's like spices and cooking. I exactly, suppose. yeah, uh-huh. it's exactly. Well, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the people that work here have um, have a lot of knowledge. There's yourself you've been brewing for a long time uh, about eight years yeah. eight years mm-hmm. on um, a homebrew level you've you've immersed yourself in the subject obviously you work here so you know all the ingredients that are available mm-hmm. who else um uh so here? i've got uh, johnny who you'll probably interview at some point he's got a great knowledge of home brewing um he's quite interested in his archaeology and his brewing history and he focuses very much on that and he's got a good knowledge of like yeast and particularly yeast strains uh ross uh he is the pleasure of uh working in the brew school at the back he gets to brew the beer uh so he's got a lot of hands-on in terms of balance really good recipes he makes fun to, oh, i don't want to compliment him too much on that but <laughs> <laughs> no he's all right <laughs> and he's got a good all-round knowledge and he knows what's going on in the brewing scene as well uh-huh. he's got a good idea of what he, he's mad on twitter uh-huh. uh, and, and all that so he knows what's going on uh-huh. he knows he knows the gossip on the street right, as well right, right. um surely the owner has a fantastic knowledge of it all um 
especially towards the wine and uh, all that stuff. Her, her family's been brewing since, well, the shop has been going since 1979. <laughs> so, uh, and, and she's been around uh, soaking up all the knowledge of the family. And, and uh, her dad. Really, really does have a, yeah, and her dad who does still work. He? <laughs> he's a consultant, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, comes in every now and again. Uh-huh. And he does the classes, and he's he's got the patter certainly. <laughs> oh, he does the classes. Now you mentioned that. Uh, just touched on that briefly. You do brewing school here. Yeah. Uh, so the brew school is kind of a second part of the business. It's uh, held to in the back. So if you're looking to learn how to get introductions to kits uh, to kit brewing, there's a two-hour class every Saturday. All right. Uh, and that's basically a sit down in the back, and uh, we just show you all the basics and. When we talk about beer from kits, it's not just beer, it's wine, cider. Of course. And uh, everything else, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can make any drink you want, mm-hmm. once you get the basics down. Um, and that's basically a very simple class in the back and uh, gets you introduced to it. And then there's, uh, at the moment, an all grain class, which is held on the, la- the last Sunday of the month, which right. is a full day, 11 till 4. We've got a Wodger coursework, uh, which has been written with the help of Fon Simpson who was the the Carlsberg Young Brewer of the Year Award mm-hmm. used to work at Wells and Youngs I think right. uh, fantastic piece of course work uh-huh. um, and basically we sit down all day with a lunch for the pub <laughs> and show you how to brew on a homebrew scale uh-huh. um, we're hoping to do an off flavours course off flavours is one of the best ways of learning how to improve your beer it's very much symptom and sign if, this, if your beer tastes like this one of these things has happened to it here's how to fix it uh-huh. so it's it's hopefully going to be a very good class which I think people from all backgrounds will be interested in that'll be fascinating home brewers yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah even people in kind of um, off licences and pubs yes. and, and breweries uh-huh. uh, because it's so important uh-huh. to, to them to be able to sell the stuff and, and to know why people will be possibly complaining uh-huh. Hopefully it will not mean more people sending beer back to the bar, but right, yeah. right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's on its way, hopefully, uh-huh. that class. Uh-huh. I'm always eyeing up, hopefully, during the country wine class. But, uh, All right. but basically the range of scope is good because we've got the space in the back and uh-huh. uh, we, we've got the facilities to brew. But uh, currently it just seems most of the time we, we're just brewing for ourselves. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we brew all these samples for the class and then we drink them. So. Oh. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like hardship. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easy. <laughs> you got anything else to add? Oh, uh, it's just enjoyable and really simple yeah. and really cheap. Um, and you can go down a rabbit hole. I mean, you can start off quite simply and there's just an endless amount of information and knowledge that you can... Like you say, you, you can keep it as simple as that, uh, as that five minutes putting it on at the very start uh-huh. and uh, just getting the results. Um, so just patience and cleansiness and you'll get the bit mm-hmm. and it'll be great and you'll enjoy it or you could get, treat it as a full on hobby and get obsessed with it like yeah. most of us like most of us <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, just like I say go down the rabbit hole and uh-huh. find an endless hobby that will uh-huh. take you to all kinds of stuff yeah. you'll, uh-huh. you'll, you'll start knowing stuff about beer that you wish you'd never known <laughs> yeah. and you find that people love talking about beer if you're involved in beer making in my, in my opinion people love to talk to you about it and there's it's a real like walking a dog in the park you'll always yeah. have someone to talk to in the pub uh-huh. well, especially <laughs> after a few drinking a few so. yeah too right <laughs> well thanks for talking to me that's been great well, pleasure hope um, it helped yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> cheers <laughs>